Good evening, everyone. If you've been to one of our webinars before, this one will be a little different. If you've gone to one of the Cerebral Palsy Research Network's webinars, tonight will be a little different too. And whether this is your first webinar with us or you've been here for every one of them, welcome. I'm Jocelyn Cohen, Vice President of Communications and Engagement with Cerebral Palsy Alliance Research Foundation, or CPARF for short. This event is closed caption enabled and I've turned on transcription should you need it. It's also being recorded and I'll send a, around a link once it's posted. For additional accessibility, I'll share a visual description of myself. I'm a white woman with dark brown shoulder length hair that's down and I have brown eyes. I'm wearing large blue green glasses and a lavender turtleneck. And sometimes I might look like my eyes are looking away from the screen or rolling, but that's part of my CP. Tonight, we'll be focusing on the exciting partnership between CPARF and the Cerebral Palsy Research Network with Michael Perlmutter, CPARF's Executive Director, and Paul Gross, President and Chief Executive Officer of the CP Research Network. Before we get to our chat, each organization will share a bit about what we do. But first, I want to share a special welcome video from Dr. Yvonne Wu. Hello everyone, welcome to the CP Alliance Research Foundation and CP Research Network Partnership Webinar. My name is Dr. Yvonne Wu. I'm a child neurologist and epidemiologist at the University of California in San Francisco. I've spent over 20 years performing clinical research studies to better understand the causes and treatments of newborn brain disorders. And in my role as a scientific advisor to both the CPARF and CPRN, I'm thrilled to participate in this new strategic partnership. As you know, each of these organizations brings unique strengths, and I believe that the synergy created by this new partnership will help both organizations further their strategic goals. So I hope you'll enjoy learning today about all the ways in which this new partnership will transform the landscape for CP research, as well as improve educational and community programming. And all of this will benefit clinicians, researchers, caregivers, and people with CP. So welcome and thank you so much for your participation. We're so thankful for Yvonne's message um, and look forward to hearing from all of you tonight. So I'll get into a little bit about what CPARF does and then pass the mic to Paul. So despite being the world's most common lifelong physical disability and affecting 18 million people worldwide, cerebral palsy is one of the most underfunded conditions. And that's why CPARF approaches cerebral palsy from all angles. We fund US-based research to change what's possible for people with CP, implement proven science and advance innovation to benefit all people with disabilities around the world. CP is a diverse disability that demands a diverse research portfolio and CPARF steadfastly supports research that serves the whole community. We start at day one with the earliest interventions to potentially lessen CP severity. We keep going with science that will make it more comfortable for children to get the therapies they need. We continue with research that will uncover new chronic pain treatments for adults like me. We look forward to expanding the research that we fund and we proudly champion research for every age and every stage. We know that research and technology go hand in hand. So nearly a year ago, we launched a pilot cohort of Remarkable US, a disability tech startup accelerator that's part of the Global Remarkable Accelerator Program. And through seed funding, mentorships, deep dives, and support during this initiative, we help startups bring life-changing technology for everyday use one step closer to the people with disabilities who need it. The world isn't built for disabled people, but thankfully there are companies built for that purpose and Remarkable US has already worked with them. They're built to fill in the gaps, meet crucial needs, and help people reach goals through access that they've never had before. We'll talk more about how this partnership amplifies our work, but first, please welcome Paul Gross, as I mentioned, the President and Chief Executive Officer of the CP Research Network and the parent of an adult child with cerebral palsy to share more about his organization's work. Great. Uh, thanks, Jocelyn. I want to I wanna continue in a, uh, what I think is a great best practice that you guys do and that we need to adopt in our webinars, which is 
uh, to, as a teacher of accessibility, describe myself. So I'm a, I'm a white male, uh, bald with uh, a um, graying goatee, clear glasses, and a navy blue step timber shirt on, in symbol of our uh, partnership. So the CP Research Network was born out of a 2014 uh, National Institutes of Health meeting that was held on the state of the science and treatment for cerebral palsy. Uh, I was there with my co-founder, Michelle Schusterman, both of us uh, as parent advocates, uh, but I was at the time on the advisory board to the National Institute of Neuro Neurological Disorders and Stroke as a patient advocate. Uh, we left that meeting with sort of different senses of what needed to happen. Michelle left knowing that the community needed evidence-based information that was consumable by lay people. And she created the award-winning CP toolkit from diagnosis to understanding that's distributed by so many hospitals and distributed uh, on, our, on our website. Uh, I actually was assigned the task coming out of the meeting of solving the problem of a national registry for CP. Uh, and I came away focused on organizing the research community around a, uh, around a registry. And so both, as, both of us being parents of children with CP, we're very patient centered and we collaborated to build the CP research network with a mission to optimize the lifelong health and wellness of people with CP and their families through research and implementation of evidence, through education and through well-being programs. So we have four main pillars. We try to engage the community in research so that it's nothing about us without us uh, as, a, as a philosophy for the research we, we do. Our research and implementation programs, our education programs and toolkits, and then finally, uh, well being programs that we do with uh, other providers in the community. So, our vision is really that by engaging the community and a vast number of health systems, we're currently at 30 and, and counting, by engaging that group in a learning health network for cerebral palsy, we can collectively focus the research and the care of people with CP on their, the most pressing issues, things like participation and quality of life. So we gather and share the lived experiences of the community and at the same time measure aspects of the healthcare process to create a platform for continuous improvement in health and well-being uh, for people with CP. Thank you so much, Paul. You know, I've learned even more about your work over the years. I knew about the CP Research Network before I started working at CPARF. And as an adult with CP, I'm especially energized by what this partnership means for people like me, for the generations behind me, and for the parents and caregivers raising and caring for their children with CP, and for the researchers doing the crucial work to ensure that more of us can benefit from proven science. We'll keep those three main groups in mind, parents and caregivers, researchers, and people with CP throughout our conversation tonight. We welcome your questions, so please add them in the Q&A box and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, to start us off, what excites each of you the most about this partnership? And Paul, why don't you go first on that? Okay, uh, well, first of all, it's a, it's a great collaboration uh, with Michael at the helm and, and Chris over before him, with you, Joss, uh, Jean-Louis, your, your board chair. I've also been working with Nadia and, and uh, Iona for years. It's just, there's just great synergy between us. And I really feel like secondarily, we're putting the wood behind one arrow. We have overlapping priorities and we can have more impact together. And then lastly, it's just greater reach, greater reach to the community, uh, greater reach to researchers, greater impact of, uh, of implementation and of technology with what you're bringing with Remarkable, I'm really excited about. So overall, it's just impact. Uh, Paul, I mean, I couldn't have said it better. I'll give a visual description of myself. It'll probably sound a little bit familiar to what Paul just said. Uh, I am a white male, also bald, uh, also with facial hair. Uh, I am wearing a, a button down blue shirt and a black sweater. Um, so what am I excited about this partnership? I, I mean, I'm excited about impact. I'm excited about making a difference in the lives of people who have CP, uh, who care for those 
loved ones who have CP. And I think that the best way to do that is to get additional resources in the hands of people who are excellent researchers, uh, like the researchers that are members of the CP Research Network, um, excellent uh, facilitators of that research, like Paul Gross, um, and uh, mostly in a patient-centered in a patient -centered way, so that all of the research and innovation and implementation that we fund and do as a collective organization um, is focused with the patient, with the person with CP in mind, first and foremost. And I think um, I'm really excited for what our two organizations can do together to move that patient-centered research agenda forward. I appreciate that, um, Michael. And so kind of playing right off of that, um, how would you say the funding priorities for our organizations are aligned with each other? Um, it all comes back to that uh, wonderful paper that uh, Cerebral Palsy Research Network did a few years ago uh, on the patient-centered research agenda. Um, we uh, love it when our researchers publish. We love it when our technologists get new products to market that make a difference in people's lives, but it's all about the lives in which they make a difference. The research is there as a tool um, to improve the lives of people with cerebral palsy um, and in our technology programs, other disabilities as well. And I think the alignment between our two organizations is actually identical because um, CP Research Network just put into into practice and into paper and into publication, what we've been striving to do since our founding in 2015, which is to, to make impact, to generate impact for people with cerebral palsy. And I couldn't, I couldn't think of a better organization uh, for us to learn from, for us to get resources to, um, and a better partner in Paul and Michelle and the wonderful members of the CP Research Network. Paul, did you have anything you wanted to add? Well, so, I mean, I think we're very synergistic here, and I love hearing you talk about your sort of expanded um, set of priorities that are, are, like us, just very focused on patient-centered or community-centered uh, priorities. So focus on the outcomes and quality of life for people with CP. I mean, we have other big areas that, uh, like, you know, genetics is a big area of focus for us. Uh, chronic pain as a key element of our work in adult uh, care and uh, well-being and pain. Are, these are key study areas. Uh, we hope to collaborate in the future on early detection and expand our, our work to include early detection and early intervention. So I just think uh, the possibilities are, are pretty broad and very aligned. Yeah, like I said earlier, it's it's really exciting to me. And as someone with CP who experiences chronic pain, um, the sooner we can get those answers and the help, uh, the better. Um, so playing off of what I just um, said, you know, the the CP experience is is different for everybody. I'm an adult with CP, um, but the parents and caregivers of, of children with CP have a whole different experience than I do. So Paul, as the parent of a child with CP, how will this partnership help families like yours? Uh, and so it's, it's probably worth me saying, so I do have an adult son, but he just turned 18 last month. Um, and, uh, you know, he's got spastic diplegia, so he, uh, you know, mostly ambulates independently, uh, but has dealt a lot with pain already. But uh, he's a transitioning teen, so we're, you know, we're learning about how to do this transition to adult health care. And he's going to college in New York. So this is going to help us because I'm going to call on all of you <laughs> while he's over there in New York. But really increasing and spreading the evidence base for care is super important to us uh, as we've, we've received care throughout different places in, in the country. Um, and then I think it's really hope. It's hope for the innovations that can come you know, more immediately from the likes of, of Remarkable but from the great research that I feel like the CP Research Network is doing and the great research that you guys are funding more, more broadly, I think is, uh, is super important. And then lastly, as someone who's been philanthropic in our lives, I think having a singular place to give that I know that those funds are efficiently being spent towards really important 
patient-centered questions is, is really important to me. Thank you for sharing that, Paul. Um, and I'm based in New York, so you know, outside of this, reach out. <laughs> um, so I'm a member of the community, and as a member of the community, even if I if I wasn't part of this webinar, um, how would I be able to bring my voice to this partnership? Um, I think first and foremost, uh, it is absolutely critical that you bring your voice to this partnership. Um, we say all the time in our team meetings that we um, serve the entire community and the only way that we're able to have that is if it's a dialogue if people in the community are constantly bringing their their wants for new technology their wants for new research uh, the types of projects and programs the way that uh, they want to be engaged um, and so first and foremost i just want to emphasize that this is a partnership not only between CP Research Network and Cerebral Palsy Alliance Research Foundation, but this is a partnership between both of us and the community at large. Um, and the only way that that partnership is going to be successful is if people in the community speak up. Now, we're going to give you a bunch of opportunities to do that through a number of new initiatives at CPARF this year. Um, we're going to do some face-to-face get-togethers, including at the Abilities Expo. We're still trying to figure out uh, which one we're attending, whether it'll be Chicago, New York, or Houston. Um, but we are we will be in attendance there. We're also going to do some community roundtables that we'd love for community members in different locations to be a part of. Uh, Joss and Katie Gastra from our team are excellent at that. They will um, they are both members of the community themselves, um, and they would love to engage with any and all community members. And of course, we'd love for you to engage through the wonderful resources that CPRN has. And I'll turn it over to Paul to discuss uh, one of those big ones, uh, MyCP. Great. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, so MyCP is a, is a web portal that we have built into CPRN that really allows uh, the community to access the best resources of our network. Uh, we have a private forum where people can be as de-identified or as identified as they want. We have clinicians uh, that are on that forum as well. So there's a lot of sharing of, of lived experience. There's a lot of prioritization of uh, research. There's opportunities to make connections that allow you as a community member to engage with our researchers. I see Duncan Wyatt's here and he's on a call twice a month on Fridays. I also saw Jody who's Join that effort recently to really help the clinicians have the benefit of a real time lived experience as we're advancing this work. We have our community registry where you can actually participate in uh, research. And so those are some of our, our most important ways. We have webinars as well. Our webinars are done as Zoom meetings. So at the end of the presentation, it's an open Q&A and discussion. And we found that a great way to allow the community to engage. And then lastly, awareness events. Um, we're going to announce in two days that we're doing our inaugural, our, our uh, annual photo contest, which is a great way to sort of raise awareness and share the word about, you know, life with CP uh, um, in preparation for um, CP Awareness Month uh, next month. And then fundraising activities like September are, are also great ways to, in, to engage and really make your voice heard in a number of ways. Thanks for sharing that, Paul. I do remember several years ago, again, before I was at CPARF, I definitely participated in ranking some of the research areas that I thought um, needed attention. And I remember feeling really empowered by that. So I applaud you for doing that and for making people like me feel heard in the community. Um, there's just a quick thing that came through the Q&A about the Abilities Expo. Um, just because Michael just brought it up, I wanted to ask it now. Is there, how can we help people attend the Abilities Expo or can we? Are there resources that we can point people to? Um, I know that sometimes it can be complicated logistically to attend um, given what it's like to travel in this country with a disability. And if you don't know the answer to that, I'm happy to follow up with this person after the webinar. Yeah, so I can't speak specifically to the Abilities Expo. I can say that last year um, we did a joint effort to bring a number of people to the AACPDM meeting um, who have lived experience, uh, members of the community. Um, we are 
our, our goal in doing some of this face-to-face -face work is to do it in multiple areas around the country um, where we know a lot of uh, people who depend on CPARF and CPRN research um, are located. But please reach out if, if travel to any of the locations um, is difficult. We would more than be willing to figure out an accommodation or see whether or not we can do a location that's closer to where you live. So it this is a this is a community conversation. We are completely open to learning how to be more accessible and available to all members of the community. As as I say, whether you live in Manhattan where we work or in Manhattan, Kansas. So please feel free to reach out to Jocelyn or myself and we will we will make a way for you to participate in that program. Thanks for filling that in. Um, so what additional research will the CP Research Network do as a result of this partnership? Um, and how will this partnership increase funding and collaboration to move research more efficiently through the pipeline? Um, Paul, you can kick that one off. Sure. Uh, well, for one thing, just greater awareness of our studies helps recruitment and therefore accelerates uh, completion. One of the things that's powerful about a network is its ability to uh, recruit, but recruitment is also the sort of the bane of every study's uh, um, exi existence. So that is just, that alone will be very powerful. Uh, part of this partnership includes dedicated funding that allows us to accomplish more with our, our existing registry and with our network infrastructure uh, and to we're, we're already planning for what additional studies can we do and how should we run a process to really let a thousand flowers bloom uh, as a function of this uh, partnership. Uh, I fully expect that the momentum will create more sites, more by CP participants, and these are all just things that allow us to answer questions faster uh, and conduct more studies. That's helpful, Michael. Um, I just want to also, everything that Paul said is absolutely true, but we look at this as there's additional benefit as well. So the remarkable accelerator program that we run, um, quite often those are medical technologies that would make an immediate impact in folks' lives. Uh, if they were available. Um, we're looking to our partnership with CP Research Network to have some of those institutions participate in trials for some of those devices um, and or test sites. Uh, we've seen a lot of interest once these technologies are available to market. And so I think that really it's endless and limitless about how much of the programming, how much of the additional research, how much of the additional technology, how much of the additional community engagement that will come out of the synergy between the 30 plus sites that are currently members of the CP Research Network and the research funding and technology funding that we do you know, every year. It's really creating connections between places and people and institutions that weren't necessarily connected before, at least when it comes to the, the disability tech um, startup accelerator, but also just creating a place where the conversations can be had. And I know that um, Paul and his team have done an excellent job of that at the CP Research Network, and we're happy to just join in on that conversation and expand it um, because I, I find as an adult that one of the issues is um, unless you're really invested in trying to find the information for yourself, you won't know where to find it. Or if you have the time to find the information for yourself, you'll be able to find it. But if you don't, then you won't. And so I think that another powerful piece of this partnership will be amplifying all of the work that everybody is doing so that it is, is getting out of the conversations that we're normally having and making it to people that wouldn't hear it otherwise. That's one of the things that's exciting to me. So I know that in this, in my role, I I know a lot about what's going on and I've learned so much about CP just in the last four years working at this organization. And I thought I knew a lot before I started working here. Um, so I'm excited for other people like me and parents and caregivers and researchers to find out more about what's going on in the landscape through this partnership. Um, so speaking of resources, um, how can this partnership expand on the existing toolkit resources for parents that are seeking local, federal, and school district resources 
to help guide newly diagnosed families um, through so they can use available services and improve prognoses for their children. And that was a question that came from the community. Paul, do you want to take a sure. at that? Yeah, so I think um, first and foremost is, you know, when I think of the combined reach of our two sort of websites, just, you know, organic search as being the, the way that most people find us, um, I think it's just going to make it so that our, our toolkits are more well known and more accessible to people. And I, I'm really looking uh, forward to that. We're also developing tools to aid with sort of shared decision making so that uh, the a family can have a, a tool to guide them in a discussion with uh, a, a physician or a surgeon. And we think those are really important. We've actually got research producing, validating uh, some of those tools. So we think that's uh, really important. We have three toolkits under development and one revision for this year. So we expect that there'll be a lot more coming, but we're probably missing some things. Uh, so uh, you know, if people feel specifically like they need more help when they have school age children, please give us feedback. And part of this partnership is having the resources to build those things that that shared value that being able to educate the community uh, with evidence based information is really valuable. Michael, did you want to add anything? No, Paul, Paul and Michelle are the experts in this, and I you know, I probably sound like a broken record, but there is so much for CPARF to learn from the work that CPRN has been doing successfully with these toolkits um, for a long time. And we hope that this partnership allows more people in the community to have access to those because, you know, they, it. I know they're doing a revision and I know that Paul just said that there are additional toolkits that, that we need to hear from the community what needs to be made, but I, I, their resources are absolutely invaluable to those who use it. Absolutely, and I just, it makes me think of um, my childhood that was pre-internet and how my parents um, just figured things, I don't even know how they figured things out. Um, so it kind of warms my heart that the parents out here now have, the, have these resources at their fingertips um, if, and can use them to navigate a lot of uncertainty and answer a lot of questions and know that there's a community out there for them. Um, so thank you again for doing that. Um, going back a bit to the research that we're that we're each doing, uh, will this partnership lead to more cerebral palsy research studies being conducted or do you think it will lead to quicker completion of studies or just quicker publication of results? And Michael, if you want to take that one. Yeah, so all of the above, absolutely. So this year, uh, 2023, will be the largest amount of funding that Cerebral Palsy Alliance Research Foundation has ever given in its history. It's actually not even particularly close. Um, a number of those high quality applications were submitted by members of the Cerebral Palsy Research Network, which we were really excited to see. Um, and I think this absolutely will accelerate the amount of resources that we have collectively uh, to invest in research. It will increase the quality of that research. Um, and most importantly, it will increase the, or it will speed up the time that it takes for those research projects and technologies to be adopted in the market. Because we are specifically focused on things that can have an impact in folks' lives. And the addition of a 30 plus hospital research network um, allows that translation to happen faster. It does it for technology. Um, it does it because we have a ton of quality researchers that are publishing constantly in the fields uh, that are members of the CP research network, some of them who are here on this call right now. Um, and I'm excited to see that translation happen quicker because I'm as I said in a previous webinar, I think when I first uh, took the role at CPARF, uh, it's not happening quicker, quick enough. It's not happening quick enough for the community. It's not happening quick enough for me. It's not happening quick enough for Paul, and it's not happening quick enough for any of our teams. 
And we absolutely have to commit ourselves to making that translation happen quicker because ultimately we're not, we're not in it for the publications as an endpoint. We're in it for the, the CP community as an endpoint, for the people benefiting from the research, the QI, the QA, the innovation and technology that we all so desperately want the CP community to have. I guess I would add, I, I did mention a little bit earlier that we, we're uh, already planning an array of internal awards with a very uh, definitive focus on accelerating uh, analyses from our existing data in our registry, which has over 7,500 patients in it, um, accelerating analyses of our community registry, which has over 2,000 uh, patients in it. Um, or community members, because that's actually not done in, in a clinical setting. So patient is not the right word for the other registry. We're planning six shots on goal. So we uh, came out of a meeting with NIH a few years ago, and Walter Korschetz, the uh, director of uh, NINDS, said, you know, really part of the strategy here is to take more shots on goal. And that's really been a, uh, a catchphrase for us. And so we've been developing a lot of new uh, questions all the way through the application process, and we think we'll have more chance of success. And then, uh, you know, we're we're thinking that this partnership is going to allow us to really use preliminary data, which strengthens grant applications, and create pilot studies, smaller studies that allow you to do as a stepping stone to to larger studies to answer questions, uh, harder questions to answer, multi center questions faster. So um, we're we're quite. Um, quite confident that this will have a, a, a great impact on our production, both speed and uh, and number of questions that we can answer. That's fantastic, any way you slice it. Um, so we have a few questions that have come in through the Q&A, so I'm gonna um, pick Debbie's first. She says, we talk a lot about and do research in transition from child to teen and teen to adult, however, Transition from adult to older adult, i.e. becoming more dependent, losing personal attendance, and having little to no family willing to care for someone is not really being addressed. There are many adults with CP 35 and older um, that are in nursing homes due to many scenarios. Would we as CPAR be willing to fund studies investigating the demographics of adults with CP that are in these homes and looking at education for nursing home staff and how to care for adults with CP? It's a big question, but I'll let you take it, Michael. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we specifically on your question, I think the answer is we would need to see a project that addressed that um, to evaluate it. But more generally, um, you know, people people who are children with CP hopefully grow old with CP. Uh, when I came to this field as as a novice, um, frankly you know, 19 months ago or 20 months ago. Um, I came in and did an immediate research dive. And it was quite obvious from the moment I got here that the most underfunded area of research for cerebral palsy is what it's like to age. Um, it, was, uh, it was and remains criminally underfunded, in my opinion. And uh, we are absolutely dedicated to making sure that that's no longer the case. Um, we have uh, expanded our research priorities. Um, traditionally, our research priority that adults fit under was chronic pain. Um, we have expanded our research priorities, so we now accept applications that involve any process of aging uh, for folks with CP. Um, and we did it for good reason. It, it's, a giant, it's a giant hole in the space we need to fill with high quality multi-centered research projects that that solve the questions of what it's like, you know, for um, your musculoskeletal systems, your organs, you know, how how general aging, you know, uh, that that is different for somebody who has cerebral palsy. Um, and we are absolutely committed to funding that research. I wish we got 10 times the number of applications, frankly on adults um, that we get, um, but we are always looking for high quality research projects that address um, what you're describing. Um, and, and, you know, I'm sure Paul has an opinion on this. He's 
you know, the patient-centered research guide a research paper also describes a lot of things that are related to adults. And I'll I'll turn it over to Paul to see whether he has something well, to add. I would just I would hit on the fact that Dr. Thorpe is narrowing in on an area that's probably a little bit of a gap in who we are able to recruit today to our adult well-being uh, and pain study, which she was the uh, co-PI on. And I think that what we need is to look at a proposal for how we would recruit to get that. Because what that's really going to do is characterize the incredible difference between the CP population and the typically, you know, the typically developing population that does not have a disability um, and show, show us how we can uh, zero in on needs. And so I think there's a great opportunity in there. I, um, and so love to, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Thorpe's plugged into the right places to actually get some of that question uh, developed. And um, one of the things I'd say has been great about working with Michael and CPARP on their funding mechanisms is they've been so available for questions about what's a fit for their funding mechanism. And uh, in relative to submitting a grant to NIH, it was really nice to be able to get feedback in almost real time about Oh, I don't understand this area of the grant and, and whatnot. And so, or having LOIs return so quickly. So I think these are all uh, strong support of answering this kind of question. Um, I, as an adult, did not realize until um, the death of my CP doctor when I was in my mid thirties that there was a, that there was less knowledge, less care, less understanding of adulthood. and. I'm just appreciative of the fact that our organizations are working together in every way we can to close that information gap. Um, and I'm excited to see where it goes. And I know that, as I said earlier, CP is a diverse disability. So the way that it affects me is different than the way that it's gonna affect someone um, who lives in a nursing home in their thirties, but each one of us deserves to have the same amount of information out there um, to help us in our care. I don't think anyone would assume in their childhood that when they hit their 20s or 30s um, for this not rare disability that was first identified in the 1800s that there wouldn't be this information. So I'm proud of what we're doing here um, and I look forward to what we're gonna achieve. Um, hey, hey Joss, can I add yeah. one thing real quick? Sure. Um, so we just recently had an application deadline, and I, I can't talk about the specifics, but what I can say is that we received a multiple of the most applications we've ever received before, and more than 50% of them were not related to children. Um, and I think that that shows a change in the community and a willingness and an availability of some great researchers that are doing cutting edge research on aging with CP. And I'm encouraged. We, we specifically tried to recruit people who are doing adult research and uh, our recruiting efforts uh, were effective because we received a lot of applications. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to fund some of that research. I also just do want to say that, um, or reiterate what I said earlier, which is that we care about people at every single age and stage. And there's a lot of research out there about early detection and early intervention. And we hope there can be even more advancements in that. And we want to support that. This is in addition to that, that like we don't abandon kids when they're no longer kids, um, but that we also pay attention to kids because advances are changing as the years and decades go on. So I just wanna make sure um, to reiterate that we're, we're focused somehow on the entire age range takes takes really wide peripheral vision, but we're doing it. Um, so I wanted to switch gears slightly. Anita had a comment and a question. She said, I love the marriage between technology and research. How difficult will it be to get technology products to market? So it really depends on the technology project, our product. Um, uh, but I went to uh, a cerebral palsy research network meeting last year where one of our uh, technology companies presented at that meeting um, and a number of institutions expressed interest in being involved in that work um, and are now involved in that work. Um, and so it's not going to happen overnight, especially in, you know, regulated medical device 
uh, but it it happens faster because those hospitals that are part of the CP research network stepped up to be a part of the trials that are taking place at, with multiple technologies at multiple institutions that are members of the network. Um, and that's invaluable that those products have the opportunity to make it to market years faster as a result of the involvement of some of the great institutions that are that are part of the CP research network. And so Anita, it's a great question. We'd love for it to be as fast as possible. And I think this partnership speeds us on that way. And, and I would I would uh further emphasize on that that you know there's not only this access to hospitals in our network for some of the sort of trialing and potentially accessing you know patient populations through my CP to under uh, to understand things at the early stages of product but um, when it comes to something where you need to recruit the you know the richness of, of a network like ours part of what we have is if you say, well, the inclusion criteria is I need kids between, you know, three and five that are GMFCS three. We can tell you exactly how many that we have, you know, coming into annual visits every year. Like it's just a super powerful tool for the execution of multicenter research. Thank you for sharing that. It's it's exciting to see it the partnership, not only, you know, in the, in the sort of obvious research connection, but the ways that we're interconnected with the technology and, and the research community. Um, Paul, following up on that, how will this partnership support QI work, which is closer to immediate improvement of care? And specifically, how would the partnership do this within the network and or locally? So there's, um, so QI or quality improvement is a way in which uh, you can take practices and standardize the, the practice. So as there's, you know, as a care pathway, for example, like hip surveillance comes out of the American Academy for Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine, this gives us a way to say, okay, well, that's a thing that describes care but we can actually implement that care and see how well we're doing with it. And so there's an ultimate outcome measure about kids and surgeries on their hips, but there's steps along the way to make sure they're being surveilled every you know, sort of every inch along the way. And there's different surveillance for different GMFCS gross motor function classification system levels for each one. And so, uh, so what this allows us to do is uh, take evidence um, take best practices and implement them consistently and measure the improvement in outcomes. And basically quality improvement work says that if you reduce the variation in practice, outcomes uh, improve. And that's just that's just been demonstrated to happen. So there's some places where we need to generate evidence. Um, and that's you know the, the research work, but the quality improvement very often is allowing us to implement evidence in a uh, in a uniform way to get uh, the kinds of outputs. Uh, that uh, we want to see in terms of uh, in terms of people's health. Uh, in terms of expanding um, both locally, I, I do think you know thirty centers is a lot, but you know the the country is big, and I think uh, we will see a lot more growing. We have good interest in the network, but I think we're going to see a lot more interest that's going to get us more spread out. And then uh, lastly, a project I was um, planning on talking about uh, in in wrap up is. Uh, there's an effort that we're making to look at things that we learned from COVID about telemedicine. And uh, Dr. Ed Hurwitz and I have been exploring the possibility to have experts that are spread out across the country, but to have a combination of telemedicine and a hub and spoke partnership with on the ground providers to take that CP expertise that's held in the, the brains of a few and really spread it out almost like a network map for, you know, T-Mobile or Verizon to get broad coverage of, of the U.S. So that, and that would be the same type of, uh, of capability. Oh my goodness. I love that. My God, you, I can tell you have things to say about that. <laughs> I, I'll be brief because I want to make sure we get to all these other questions. I'll just say that the dissemination of all of the work we do is the important part. 
Um, and I love hearing Paul, and we've talked about it a lot, um, about how we need to get this into the into underserved communities, how we need to make sure that it's not just academic teaching hospitals and large hospital uh, networks that have access to this research, access to this QI. And I, I know that both what he's talking about in the expansion of the network and a number of initiatives that are, that are currently underway at CPARF um, are gonna result in additional dissemination to you know, all corners of the map. And, and I know from, you know, speaking to Joss and a number of other people that, you know, we want to make sure that people don't have to do that long trip to get quality care um, because that, that, that's not the way our system should be set up, even if it is today. And so we're absolutely committed to making sure that whether you live in a small town or a big city, that the standard of care is, absolutely all of the research and best practices that come through the CP Research Network and CPER. Thank you for that. And I just knowing I know people with CP all over the country. And so it there's a lot of things that make me excited in this whole conversation. I feel like I keep saying it, but it's true. Um, just Paul, what you were talking about potentially doing with Ed Hurwitz is really really exciting to me. Um, and the idea that someone wouldn't have to fly to get orthopedic surgery on their legs, because then you know what happens, you have to fly home with that. <laughs> Not ideal um, in any way, shape or form. So i um, looking forward to seeing how that plays out and the impact that that has. Um, so Todd has an interesting question. He said, can you give me a big picture view of how the research being funded and completed and people with CP is getting back to the community kind of beyond what's been talked about today? And he also wanted to add, I think you're doing a fantastic job. I'm just always interested in how we can better close the loop. Paul, if you want to take that. Paul, oh, you want to go first? Sure. Um, well, so, um, so let me take an example that is that, that we think we're finding from our genetic study. So there's a big push from the National Institutes of Health towards uh, personalized medicine. And so one of the things that uh, clinicians find is there are responders and non-responders to interventions. Um, and so what the genetics work is going to allow us to do is start to figure out, to identify genes that can help us figure out what is the most effective treatment or what is not an effective treatment uh, for people. And that's something that can be spread very broadly. You've got a set of treatments and you've got a set of genes and you can do a test to sort of figure that out. And so that's like a very you know, real world um, example uh, that I think can have very broad impact. Thank you, Michael, did you have anything you want to add? Um, I would just encourage, so all of our projects that we fund are on our website. Um, I'm not trying to challenge anybody to read all of them, but we are doing this new effort. I believe it's called the Science Spotlight um, in which we take uh, complicated research that we fund and put it into lay language so people like myself can understand it. Um, and it's designed to be so that people of the, people in the community can access the research that we do. We're also doing these face-to-face -face efforts at the Abilities Expo. Um, we're gonna put researchers in front of community members in a variety of ways, whether it be webinars, um, podcasts, these face-to-face -face meetings, and we want to meet people where they are. So I think Paul's example is a great example, but we also want the community to be able to pull that information not just push it out through providers. And so I think we're dedicated to both of those things. And I know we need to do, frankly, need to do a better job in this because, um, because a person with CP or their caregiver is, the, is, is, they have a lot of burden put on them and trying to discover the latest and greatest research or innovation you know, off the internet is, is an unfair burden. We need to do a better job in disseminating that to the community. Can I add one more that's maybe a little more, you know, the genetic stuff is has a ton of promise and we're already finding examples where uh, things can be tuned. But uh, another thing that we're doing is this uh, 
in our adult care quality improvement process where we've raised the number of people that are assessed for pain to well over 90% at every visit. And then where we're gonna turn next is to categorizing that pain into different uh, categories that then have different treatments. And where we're ultimately going to go to is knowledge translation tools. So yeah, if you go to Denver and Ann Arbor and uh, New York City to the Weinberg Center uh, and you know and other centers that are doing this uh, adult care, you're going to get the, the benefit of this treatment. But we're going to create tools like algorithms that can be used when somebody comes into an ER or goes to a PCP that can very be very easily be used to get the benefits of this research and this uh, quality improvement work. Thank you for adding that, Paul. Um, someone in the Q&A said, there seems to be a general philosophy for treatment to not seek improvement in functional outcomes in adults. E.g., if range of motion is maintained, then the adult is left on their own and asked to return for treatment only if some event happens that adversely affects function. Is CPRN looking at data in adults where function is maintained and even improved with continued interventions? Yes, absolutely. In fact, if uh, I would encourage this person, so right now I will say our community registry um, is closed for input right now because we've made a transition of our data center to the University of Pittsburgh. It will be opened in the next week or two, I believe. But I would encourage uh, this uh, person to participate in that. And part of what we do is we ask about uh, your level of function and is it the best it's ever been? Has it declined? And it's an annual survey because we're trying to capture that. What what improved it most? Like, what would you attribute improvements to? What would you attribute um, declines to? So we are ab absolutely actively studying that. That's really good to know. Um, Michael, did you did you have anything to add? You looked like you might, so I wanted to give you a chance. No, I was just trying to get some people in the chat room. I was going to type in their answers for easy questions, but I- uh, oh, okay. Um, one thing someone alluded to was just about mental health. So we've talked a lot about physical health in this conversation. Um, and I know overwhelmingly and maybe exclusively, I need to go look back at all of our research that we also are funding, you know, like looking into treatments and everything for kind of physical parts of CP. But um, as you're able, like, what would you say about CP and mental health research in this regard and how like the two things overlap, um, maybe, maybe specifically, maybe incidentally, um, and, and if you'd want to fund research in that area or Paul, if you have additional information about that area. Uh, so I would say that I believe this is a gap. Um, I think it's, uh, there is, so our adult health and well-being study is intended to be like a, a foundational cross-section for us to use as not only the analysis that we can get out of that, but preliminary data for more studies. And so we ask a lot about uh, mental health, about uh, depression and anxiety, about stigma. Um, and so we think we're creating a base of information. Uh, and there are uh, a number of researchers um, uh, clinical researchers in, in this field that are focused on CP, and we think there'll be tremendous opportunity to influence uh, them with the data that we're, that we're going to produce. But it's definitely a gap and needs to be addressed in the coming years. Oh, I, I, I agree with Paul. I think this is a blind spot to us. I think that much more research needs to be funded in this area. Um, and we've, you know, we've certainly anecdotally heard about this being a huge issue and, and would love to get applications or, or collective uh, collaborative projects with, with CPRN or others uh, related to mental health. Mm -hmm. um, one quick thing I'll say, just a lot of the things that children with CP go through, physical therapy, occupational therapy, maybe even speech therapy um, and surgeries, can be considered traumas. Uh, and so I know it's different now than it was when I was a kid, but maybe when we're thinking, and maybe Paul, this is already happening in some of the toolkits that you're working on behind the scenes, but like 
adding that in or making sure that that's high up on the list of, of the things that you recommend um, to parents and caregivers for kids. Uh, even if they don't necessarily have the words to talk about it, the way that if you can work through that when you're younger, it will help you um, as you grow up and having the space to talk about something that's happening to you regularly, but that maybe is painful or makes you feel different or other um, would be really helpful for both children and parents. Um, and honestly, I don't know what it's like to be the parent of a child with CP, but I'd imagine that there's some of your own trauma happening there um, from either the birth experience or the medical experience or just having to take your kid um, through different things. And so putting that in there for the parent and caregiver as well, and not just the child, make sure you, you know, that whole phrase, like put on your own oxygen mask first, um, I would just recommend that. And um, there's about three minutes left. And so there's a few other things in the Q and A, um, but there's with three minutes left, I just wanted to see if either of you had anything you didn't get to mention tonight that you wanted to leave uh, folks with before I close things out. I'll, uh, let me, I wanna add one thing uh, to what you just said. So we did research CP back in 2017, which was sort of all encompassing. Uh, we did research CP dystonia edition in 2019, 2020. Uh, I've been feeling the need to do at least one more research CP that's aimed at teens and young adults, where I think we could capture the kind of need of information that you're describing in your in that last bit, Jocelyn, that I think would be great. And maybe that's something we can collaborate on and do together. I think Absolutely. it would be very galvanizing for the research agenda and the whole community. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the, the um, last thing I, I got to describe my sort of network effect of like uh, my T-Mobile uh, Verizon effect, which I wanted to end on. But I know I had a lot of questions and I see a lot of CPRN researchers here. And I just want to say that uh, we intentionally took your questions and said, we're going to put them aside and we're going to do them in a upcoming uh, CPRN uh, research, uh, a CP research network meeting that we have um, uh, twice a month anyway. So we'll get to those questions soon. But we're always open to questions on, on my CP. We're, we're there all the time and can answer questions or send mail to paul at cprn.org. And I'm glad to answer anybody's question. Thank you, Paul. Michael? Um, I just thank you to everybody that attended. I see so many names that are instrumental in making both of our organizations uh, able to achieve what we've achieved to date and what who will help us achieve much more in the future. Um, I just want to reiterate something I said earlier, which is this is a this is a dialogue. Um, we wanted to introduce you to the partnership tonight, uh, but we'd love for you to be a part of the partnership. Um, I have a much more complicated email address because I have a much more complicated last name, and it's in my email address. But my email address is michael.perlmutter at cparf.org. Um, and I would love to continue this conversation with anybody who has any questions about the partnership, has any questions about the work that we do, um, needs access to resources, or has any idea, um, any ideas for research projects that could be done. Um, the, the ideas will come from the community. Um, and so if you don't share them, they may never come from the community. And so we ask everybody who's involved with this or a part of this community to be a part of this dialogue. Um, and I look forward to hearing from you. Here, here. That was well yeah. fun. Thank you, Paul and Michael, um, for your time, dedication, and all of your really helpful answers tonight. Thanks to everyone who asked questions and joined us. I want to make sure you're signed up for our mailing list to stay up to date on our work. You can head to our websites, cparf.org and cprn.org for information and links to all of our social platforms. Um, you can catch the next CP Research Network webinar next Tuesday, February 21st at 8 p.m. Eastern, and that will focus on sensory study findings. CPARF's next webinar will be in late March, and we'll focus on our next disability tech startup cohort, um, so stay tuned for more soon. And just uh, following up on what Michael said, if you go to our About Us page, I think all of our bios have our email addresses or links to email us, so if you didn't get his Full name down, you can find him there. Um, once again, thanks everyone for coming and have a great afternoon or evening wherever you may be. Thanks, Joss. Thanks, Joss.